Alright, so for a long time people have been talking about me asking, does this guy even like anything that he reads? And like, obviously I do. You know, I have positive reviews out and stuff. It's just oftentimes more fun to pick apart exactly why something is bad and why it doesn't work. And so I focus on that a lot, and plus those often get more views. But for this one, for this one time, just to appease the people who talk like that, I'm going to talk about my top 10 favorite books that I've ever read. Now, uh, these are individual books. They aren't, these aren't like full series that I'm talking about. And there's going to be massive, massive, massive spoilers for everything that I talk about. So as soon as I bring it up, if it's something you don't want to get spoiled, just skip to the next one, please. And, well, it's, it's a top 10 list. You know how that works. Let's get started. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. Number 10 is Where the Red Fern Grows. Now, this book is something that I'm not normally into because it's one of those, like, classic literature things that they made you read in school. And from what I understand, a lot of other people read the Where the Red Fern Grows in elementary or middle school, so I'm not alone in this. That said, it's a beautiful, beautiful book. It's just about this uh, country boy who wants to get some hunting dogs so that he can hunt down raccoons, uh, which is a popular thing in the area where he lives, and he, for a long time, he saves up money to get some. He gets some, and it works out great, and then the, most of the book is just him training them, training them to learn to hunt, and then uh, them hunting and being good at it, winning contests and stuff, and then, as with all these, like, a boy and his dog type stories, it ends tragically. The dogs die. You know, there's a horrible mountain lion attack, and one of them dies, and then the other one just refuses to eat or anything, and then she dies, and yeah, it's really, really sad, but that's life. You know, that that's the thing about it, is it's a beautiful story, and you really feel for the dogs and the boy, but life does go on. That's how things work. Whether you're talking about pets or friends or family members, eventually they will leave you, or you'll die and leave them. And in fact, the prologue and the epilogue of the book is the boy as an old man who's living off in the city now, and he's just reminiscing about his old life and reminiscing about the dogs, and he loves them and he misses them, but he understands that life does go on. And I think that's an important message for people of all ages, but especially young people. So this is one of those cases where schools making you read a book, I think, works out okay. And well, no, I, I don't have a whole lot else to say. It's just, in broad strokes, very beautiful book, and even now that I'm older, I've reread it once or twice, and it's still beautiful, heartbreaking story. Number nine is The Last Olympian, which is book five of the Percy Jackson and the Olympian series. Now, a lot of you have probably read this one because it was a popular series, and it was basically just Harry Potter, but with Greek gods instead of wizards. And yeah, it's, it's a great series. You know, the first four books are various plots about Kronos trying to come back to life, and at the end of the fourth book, Battle of the Labyrinth, he, he finally does come back, and they're like, well, shit, now what? He's coming back, Typhon's about to emerge, there's other gods that are siding with Kronos, like, how are we gonna do this? And then the fifth book comes around, and the bulk of it is just this giant battle in Manhattan, where they're trying to prevent uh, the forces of Kronos from reaching the Empire State Building, which is the em uh, entrance to Olympus, and destroying the gods' thrones, because the gods are off fighting Typhon, and they're very busy. Now, I said a while ago that the Battle of Hogwarts in Harry Potter was very similar to this, except Battle of Hogwarts was a little bit better, because it actually took place at Hogwarts Castle, which was the main setting of most of the series, whereas Percy Jackson, the Battle of Manhattan, was, you know, in Manhattan, which the majority of the books had not been anywhere near there. And a lot of people were talking to me like, um, actually, the entrance to Olympus is in Manhattan. That's why they were fighting there. No shit, guys. Stop being stupid! But the characters don't have any sort of real connection there, and the reader's audience don't have any real connection there. Like, Percy lives there, which, okay, great, but... Th there's very little time spent there. Th this isn't the magical world that we've become so enamored li with. That would be like Camp Half-Blood, or Olympus itself, or uh, the Labyrinth, or just the Sea of Monsters, other places like that. If they were fighting in one of those places, it'd be a lot better, is all I'm saying. All that said, still a fantastic battle. 
You know, it's still a small group of demigods who are vastly outnumbered by these legions of monsters and other demigods and the occasional actual god shows up to fight, and it's, it's bad. And so Percy actually has to kind of sacrifice part of his humanity almost when he uh, bathes in the river Styx and gets the, oh I forget the name, but it's the same blessing that Achilles had. It, it actually might just be called the Blessing of Achilles. Uh, this is why you write shit in your notes before you start filming, James. But anyways, yes, he gets the same blessing that Achilles has where he's really powerful, but he also has one weakness, and if that one weakness gets hit, he's, he's done. That's, that's everything. And there's a lot of talk about bringing the gods together, like bringing the gods who have not joined the battle for one petty reason or another. There's a lot of Percy and company trying to get them to join up together and put aside their petty differences, because like if they don't, then they're all going to die. Olympus is going to get destroyed, and all that important stuff like that. That's, that would be bad for them, obviously. So that's a big part of the book. And while no uh, major, major characters die, in this one, it literally starts off with a side character named Beckendorf dying because him and Percy go off on a mission and shit goes south. And then a couple others die along the way. And it's, um, it, it's not like super intense when that happens, but it is still sad and does raise the stakes. It makes you think like, oh, Grover or Annabeth or someone else might get it. So let's be careful. And then, well, obviously the good guys win and the bad guys lose, but it's still a very cool, epic, intense battle, which takes up the bulk of the book. The, the characters still go through some growth and grow up and become better people. And at the end, in the resolution, they do change the world for the better. Like Percy gets the gods to finally agree to uh, acknowledge their children all the time. Like not necessarily um, interact with them and treat them nicely, but always acknowledge them so that they at least know who they are. And that's a pretty big deal. And it's just a good way of showing uh, dysfunctional families maybe not necessarily start loving each other unconditionally, but putting aside their differences and reaching a new, uh, what's the word? Reaching a new understanding. Number eight, Sphere by Michael Crichton. So I, this is my favorite Michael Crichton book and I might get some shit for that because even though I love Jurassic Park, I just think Sphere is a lot better than Jurassic Park because it's just scarier in my mind. Like, all of Michael Crichton's books have some sort of um, cautionary message to them, or at least all the ones that I've read. Like, Jurassic Park is mankind should not play god with nature. Um, Sphere and the Andromeda Strain are outer space is scary, be, be careful with it. Um, timeline is about how so, some areas are just dangerous and you shouldn't be playing around in them like they're tourist playgrounds, and also not every uh, scientific advancement should be advanced solely for profit. Like, there's a, uh, sometimes it's just too dangerous for that, or you can fuck things up too much, and no matter how many fail-safes you put in place, things are gonna go wrong. Uh, and so, Sphere, out of all those, though, is the scariest and the most cautionary to me, because it starts off, the military finds uh, something underwater. Like, in they look at it and it looks like, oh, it's a big spaceship of some sort, but that's not ours, and they also look at the coral, gro coral growth and they realize it's been there for over 300 years. So they think, oh, shit, this definitely isn't ours, this is alien. So they bring in a whole team of experts together, just like they, just like they did in Timeline and Jurassic Park, uh, and they send them down underwater to these little uh, underwater base things to investigate the ship and find out what it is, and can they get anything out of it, is it dangerous, all that stuff. However, once they're down there and they actually go into the ship, they notice that most of the writing in it is in English, and they access the computer, and it turns out it actually uh, took off hundreds of years in the future, and it was built by humans, and somehow it came back in time. But there's also this big sphere on it, which is not human in origin, it's something alien, and it starts making weird shit happen, and eventually they realize, oh, it gives us some sort of crazy power which we can use to do all kinds of crazy stuff. Well, what was the point of all that? And the biggest uh, scary part of Sphere is that we don't know what the Sphere is. We don't know what it wants. We don't know if it's sentient or not. We don't know who or what built it or why. And we don't know how the human ship got sent back in time. We don't know 
what it was uh, intending to do in the first place. There's so many mysteries that we never find out the answer for, and I'm not sure I want to find out the answer to them, because I read this when I was fairly young for the first time. I think I was around 12 when I read it. And looking back, it was my first uh, interaction with cosmic horror, because, yeah, it's something way bigger and more powerful than humanity, and even just finding out what it is is terrifying. Part of why I think that this book isn't more popular, and part of why I think it didn't really um, make a very good movie, is that a pretty big portion of it is just people sitting around in rooms looking at data, trying to interpret it, and uh, trying to figure out mysteries of like, oh, what's going on, until finally it clicks. And while that can be pretty uh, engaging in the form of a book, and pretty intense in the form of a book, it doesn't always work that well in a visual medium, so I, I, I get it why the movie wasn't that great. It's still not terrible, because there are a couple of action scenes, but, y you know, I get it, and I get why other people wouldn't like this one as much, but still, Outer Space is scary, therefore, Sphere's a great book. Number seven is World War Z. D does this one even need introduction? Come on, it's, it was written by Max Brooks, it had that, um movie, which was fine, but it had nothing to do with the book. It was a shitty adaptation. Man, what a waste of good source material. And this one is just a series of interviews about people who did various different things during a 10-year-long zombie war. And, I mean, I can't really talk about all of them, but I can say that we get to see the world um, slowly discover this new virus that's going around, and then slowly start to fall apart as the governments either don't want to deal with it, or don't know how to deal with it, and individual citizens certainly don't know how to deal with it. So it's just this new disaster that we're not prepared for, which is a, you know, a common theme in Max Brooks's works. I, I reviewed De-Evolution a little while ago, and that was a huge part of that one as well. But uh, yes, World War Z is just all about how humans were not prepared for this disaster, and so it almost killed us, but then we adapted to it, and we pushed it back, and then we took back most of the world. Not all of it, you know, the zombies are still there. They're still a threat. There's still some places that are entirely overrun by them, but humanity has overtaken most of the planet, and now we have adapted. We know how to live with the zombies. So the only thing about this book that was a real problem to me, and I wish it had uh, not been this way, was that the interviewer doesn't really get a personality or a story. Like, if he had ended it or at some point in there, put in his own story, like, hey, I was just a regular refugee and this was my experience, or something like that, that would have been a lot better. As it stands, World War Z is still the best zombie story out there. You know, because it, it's not really about the zombies, it's about how weak human societies really are, and just shows all of the issues with not only our cultures, but the way we individually act, and our governments. Number six is The Reunion, which is Animorphs book number 30. Now this is the one where Marco runs into his mother, aka Visser One, again, and they actually interact for the first time rather than just him seeing her at a distance. And those of you who have read Animorphs probably already know exactly why I put this on the list. Those who haven't might be a little confused. There's a crazy amount of backstory to the series which I can't really get into. I'll do my best to summarize it. Basically, there's this alien race of like these slug things called Yurks, which can sl slide into your brain and take it over and perfectly imitate you. They've already taken over a bunch of other planets this way, and now they're trying to infiltrate Earth. But there's this other group of aliens who are, well, they're not the good guys, but they're the better guys called the Andalites. One of them crashes on Earth one day, and a bunch of kids run across it, and the Andalite tells them all about the situation, and he gives them the ability to uh, morph into animals. Pretty straightforward. One of the Animorphs is a guy named Marco, and his mom died about a year before the story begins, uh, but it turns out his mom is a controller, which is someone who was taken over by a Yurk, and not only is she a regular controller, she is actually a controller for one of the highest ranking Yurks uh, in existence. She's in charge of the uh, invasion of Earth. Uh, her name is Visser One, and she is, by this point, for various reasons, kind of... Um, Maybe not exiled is the right word, but she's not very well liked and she's kind of being hunted down by other Yurks. And so she finds the Animorphs and they have to kind of make a deal with her, all that in order to try and get the other Yurks there. Because the Animorphs, 
they're not really trying to destroy the Yurks because they can't do that, they know they can't, but they are trying to slow down their invasion enough that Andalite reinforcements can come and save them. And so some stuff goes down and Marco is like very emotionally torn about this because he just wants to save his mom so badly and that's the main uh, thing that he's trying to do in this book. Like he, it's not that he doesn't care about trying to save other people from Yurks or, or any of that, like that's still a big deal to him, but he just wants his mom back. He wants to save her because he's thought that she's dead and he's only like 14 or 15 at this point and he has a chance to get her back. But at the end of the book, not only is he unable to save her, he has to kill her himself. And it's... Oof. Man, like, that one moment kind of makes all of the Animorphs for me. Like, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of great moments in that series, and a lot of really, really dark moments in that series, but... That one stands out, even among all the other shit that's in there, because he has to say I love you to his mom and then at that moment the the controller and his mom realize who he is because the animals hide their identities and then he has to throw her off a cliff and it later turns out that she survives which does admittedly take some of the bite out of it but still Jesus Christ that was a hard moment to read when I was a kid and even looking back it's still damn like that's the moment where Marco really became a true, um, I don't, I don't even know how I would put it, but he went from just being someone who is trying to save the world and his loved ones to someone who I will kill the Yurks at any cost. Number five, the Hero of Ages, which is Mistborn number three, or the end of Mistborn Era one, however you want to say that. Now this one will probably be a bit controversial because the ending to the original Mistborn series is controversial, but honestly, I don't know what the hell people are talking about. This one's amazing. So, the first two books, you find out that there are these two gods on the planet Skadriel called Ruin and Preservation, who have a yin and yang thing going on. They're keeping each other in check, but at the same time, they can't really create anything without the other. And anyways, they find out that Ruin has been freed from his prison, and Preservation is slowly dying, and so they need to find a way to deal with Ruin, or he will just destroy the whole planet. And that's mostly what this book is about. It's about them trying to finally reunite all the final corners of uh, the final empire, which is a stupid name, but whatever, it is what it is. And it's, it's just them trying to reunite everything and find a way to defeat Ruin. And it seems very hopeless for a very long time, but near the end, everything clicks and comes together. Like stuff that has been hinted at since the first book, finally comes into play. Like, why does Vin uh, have the ability to pierce through copper clouds and sense when people are using allomancy even when they're hiding it? It finally comes out why. It turns out Ruin had manipulated her mother into killing her sister and putting her powers into the earring that Vin wears all the time so that Vin is able to use that and that enhances her own powers. Oh, shit, okay. Uh, where is the Lord Ruler's Atium stash? Well, it turns out it was all hidden in the mines where the ATM comes from to begin with. Or, not all of it, but the majority of it was hidden there. Oh, okay, the Kandra have it. That, oh, all right, that's, that's helpful. And then from the beginning of this book, why are some of the soldiers being attacked by the mists? Why are they dying? Well, it turns out some of them are ATM mistings. And then at the end, they get to fight a whole army of Coloss, which are being sent by Ruin in order to try and get the ATM, because it turns out the ATM is actually his body, and then Elend and the army of Mistings that can now suddenly see the future use up all the Atium to fight the fucking Coloss, and it's a crazy epic moment. Like, that that's the thing about this, is that it does what an epic fantasy finale should do. It has a bunch of crazy epic battles, a bunch of crazy epic moments, a bunch of crazy powerful self-sacrifices from Elend and Vin and others, and in the end, Vin becomes preservation for a little bit, and she realizes she can't kill Ruin without killing herself, so she does. She kills herself and Ruin. But the world is still about to be destroyed, and her friend Seized, uh finds the body of her and Ruin, and he realizes, oh shit, we're all about to die. Wait a minute. No, we don't have to do that. And so he takes both of their powers. He becomes a god. He becomes the god Harmony, and he fixes the whole world. He saves everybody. And I've read stuff before where like, the main character turns out to not be the hero. It turns out, oh, the real hero 
turns out to be this person at the last second. And it's not always super satisfying. Whereas this one, it comes out, not out of nowhere, but it comes out and you're like, oh, that, that actually makes sense. Like it fits with the prophecy that was there before. And it makes sense that Seize would do this. It makes sense that Vin would act that way. Yeah, this all works. And so, yeah, just fantastic ending. I don't know what people are talking about. Like, are, are they just disappointed that the world was saved in such a way? I just, I just don't get it. Number four, A Memory of Light, which is A Wheel of Time 14, or The Wheel of Time 14, which is the final book in the series. This is another climax, which was also well, sort of written by Brandon Sanderson. It, you know, was obviously outlined and all that by Robert Jordan, but Sanderson finished it. And a, a slight tangent, uh, during my Wheel of Time uh, world-building analysis a long time ago, uh, I mentioned that it was my introduction to Brandon Sanderson and people got pissy at me for saying that for some reason. Guys, he he finished the last couple of books. That's where I first saw his name. That's That was my first introduction to his work, even if it's not 100% his work. I'm not sure what you want me to say there, but, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, Wheel of Time, Memory of Light, uh, th that's also how you end an epic fantasy series. Like, this one is a little bit more predictable, don't get me wrong, but that's not bad. Like, we've known for many books by this point that Rand is going to have to face the Dark One and shove him back into his prison, and there's going to have to be a last battle, <clears throat> excuse me, where millions and millions of Trollocs and Darkspawn are gonna be coming in trying to kill everybody and humans just have to fight back or they die and that's that's the one rule to it and that's pretty much the entire book it's just the last battle it's like 800 pages of that in fact there's a chapter in there which is just called the last battle and it's like 180 pages <laughs> but this is everything you want in, a la in an epic battle. It has last stands, it has uh, the heroes trying to make plans, and then those plans go awry, and they think they're fucked until they make new plans. It has uh, intelligent battle strategy, which is surprisingly rare in any sort of fiction, really, which is very annoying to me, but whatever. The Wheel of Time has it, and A Memory of Light also has, you know, bad guys making final stands and finally getting killed. It has good guys heroically self-sacrificing themselves, and it's just everything I wanted when I was when I was first reading it. Like, I had waited over a year since uh, I had finished Towers of Midnight up until A Memory of Light came out, and I was not disappointed by anything. Now, I will say that some of the self-sacrifices could have been better. Like, for example, when Demondred, uh leads an entire gigantic circle of channelers and he leads this army there and he keeps challenging Rand, hey come out and fight me and so other dudes come up to try and fight him like Galad and Gawain and they sacrifice themselves and it doesn't work and then Lan comes out and he says I did not come here to win I came here to kill you and first off amazing fucking line and then Lan uh, manages to kill Damondred by letting himself be stabbed, and then that leaves Damondred vulnerable for just a minute, so he kills him, and that uh, allows the battle to go back in the Forces of Light's favor. And that's really cool, but then it turns out, oh, Lan winds up surviving, and that just, that takes some of the bite out of it, know what I mean? Like, it's not really a self-sacrifice if you aren't self-sacrificing. That won't work, Chaozu! We already wished you back once with the Dragon Balls! We can't do it twice! But still, awesome epic moments. There's, I mean, I can't even name them all here. There's dozens of really cool moments where I just went, whoa, that was awesome. Whoa, that was cool. And then, <laughs> well, there's not even anything else to say here. It wraps up the story. Uh, it wraps up a lot of character arcs. It develops a lot of characters further than they were before. And while there are a couple little nitpicks I have with it, overall, fucking amazing book. Number three, The Way of Kings. Now, d don't worry, this is the final Sanderson book, so if someone's upset that I keep putting him on here, this is the last one. But the Stormlight Archives, man, a lot of people's favorite seems to be Oathbringer, and don't get me wrong, I really like Oathbringer. I think it's a phenomenal book, but it also could have been like 10 or 20,000 words shorter. But Way of Kings, not a single word is wasted, okay? That is the introduction to this story. It's the introduction to this world. 
It's the introduction to the Desolations and the Heralds and uh, the High Storms and the Everstorm and all that important stuff. Even if you don't understand it completely, all of that important stuff comes in here. And Shallan's story is, it's kind of a, it seems like a side story at first in this one and it doesn't really connect until the second one, but that one's, that one's still pretty good. I, you know, I like Shallan as a character. I like all the stuff she's getting into. I like uh, Zeth's story. Uh, Dalinar's story is also a lot of fun, and it gives context to everything, and, you know, all that great stuff. But this one is primarily focused on Kaladin, and I would still say Kaladin is the best character in Stormlight Archives so far, because he has been beaten down a lot over the course of his life, and just, oh, so many horrible things keep happening to him, and it's ended with him being a slave, who is contemplating suicide at the beginning of this, and he eventually manages to, you know, step back from the edge and he says, you know what, I'm, I'm not dying, I decide I want to live, and I'm gonna make these other slaves that I'm with also want to live. So he does that. He trains with them, he makes them all become friends, and he starts getting them into this idea that, hey, maybe we'll be able to escape one day. And so they keep training like that, and they also work at it a little bit in order to help themselves survive better during the battles because they don't really have any protection. And during all this, Kaladin also starts discovering his Knight's Radiant powers, which are kind of weak compared to what he can do later, but still very impressive and almost unknown by uh, the people in this world's standards, which, yeah, it, it, that, that's cool to see him uh, discover all that and everything. But when the climax comes, when Dalinar and a bunch of his men are left stranded and surrounded uh, by all the Parshendi, and they're definitely going to die, and Kaladin and his bridgemen have a chance to just run off. Like, they, they get separated from the army, they have a chance to, hey, we can just leave. You know, we can escape, we don't have to be slaves anymore. But then they see all the thousands of men that are about to be killed behind them, and they just, Kaladin and the others can't bring themselves to leave them there. So they run off, and they go and save them, and a lot of themselves die in that battle. But Kaladin finally speaks the second ideal of uh, the Knight's Radiant, which is, I will protect those that cannot protect themselves. And they wind up getting freed anyways. They finally get a purpose in life. And that's the thing that made this so powerful to me, is that Kaladin doesn't see a purpose in life, but he finally forces himself to find one. And that's the thing. Purpose in life usually won't just hit you in the face, but you have to go out and find it, and Kaladin did, and even though his character still goes through a lot of development after this, that is the core of it. He wants to protect those that cannot protect themselves, and he does that admirably. Number two, Abaddon's Gate, which is The Expanse, book number three. Now, The Expanse, the first two books, they introduce the proto-molecule, which is this thing created by another alien race. They don't know anything about it. All they know is that they're old and the laws of physics are their bitch. And they play around with it a little too much and at the end of the second book, a gate appears. What the fuck is that? Appears on Venus and moves itself out to the outer edges of the solar system and they immediately set up a blockade and they're like, do not touch this thing. We're not fucking with it. Just leave it alone. But at the beginning of Abaddon's Gate, some guy goes through it, and it opens up, and it's a gate to another dimension. Another dimension which is full of other gates and a sort of space station, and all of it appears to have been built by whoever built the proto-molecule. Abaddon's Gate has the tone of a ghost story, or a horror story. Well, I guess most ghost stories are horror stories, but whatever, you get the point. There's this abandoned area that you don't know much about, and you don't know if the people who built it have just left or they're all dead. And it turns out they are all dead, but then we start wondering, well, what killed them, and how, and how are we gonna avoid meeting that same fate? And that's a very, <laughs> a very difficult question to a answer, because the space station almost does blow up the entire uh, soul system, which is kind of a stupid name for it, but it's, you know, the one we live in with Earth and Mars and all that. Like, it almost blows all of that up because the humans are just messing around with its security protocols. And, I mean, just knowing how unfathomably old these things are, and how unfathomably powerful they are, and how the laws of physics mean nothing to them, even though we have to abide by that, that's... 
that's just terrifying to know and terrifying to think about. And in addition, this book uh, also gets finally a decent villain in the form of Clarissa, who, even though she is, um, well, I wouldn't say she's in the right, but she does have real reason to hate James Holden, and so it makes sense why she does all this stuff, but it also makes sense why she eventually has her turnaround and decides to help save everybody. And it does make sense why these other humans would be so terrified of this thing that they would try and uh, kill all themselves in order to shut it down, even though it, it wouldn't wind up working, but, you know, it, it would seem like a heroic self-sacrifice to them. And all of this makes sense, and so we still get some uh, cool action scenes between humans that are fighting and all that. This whole book mostly gets such a high spot on the list because of the horror, though. Like, uh, again, I, I like cosmic horror, but it's very rare that it can do it super well nowadays. A and, in fact, most of the time when something works well as cosmic horror, I've noticed it doesn't really advertise itself as cosmic horror, but I, I don't know, that that's kind of a side tangent, whatever. Basically, the point is, in this one, we find out the protomolecule creators are dead, we find out someone or something killed them, but we don't find out that much about either of them, and then at the end, all the gates open up and humanity can go out into thousands of new solar systems, but also, what now? You know, what, what happens next? And... <sighs> well, the rest of the Expanse is seeking to answer that, because shit's getting even more real. But the last book hasn't come out yet. Like, hurry up, guys. Come on. We haven't even gotten a title or a release date of any sort. Come on. Hurry up. And finally, number one is The Last Four Demonata Books. Now, I know I said this was individuals, but hear me out for a sec. The, the Last Four Demonata Books are written almost like it's just one book, but it's split into four pieces. Like, if this were an epic fantasy and this were the climax, all of the events of those four books would probably just be mushed into one, because the first three of them, uh, which are books seven, eight, nine in the series, uh, those take place more or less simultaneously. It just follows different characters, and then number ten is the real climax. Whereas, I think if this had been epic fantasy or space opera or something like that, rather than young adult fantasy, I think that it would have just uh, gone back and forth between the characters up until near the end where it just follows uh, Grubbs all the way through. But now that I've defended my <laughs> placing this on the list, which if I'm being honest, I could have just said, fuck you, it's my list, I'll do what I want. But now that I'm done with that, this is basically how you end a series perfectly. So in the Demonada, there are, you know, obviously demons that live in other dimensions that occasionally come in and attack humans, and some humans have magic so they fight back against that. That seems pretty straightforward. Um, and earlier on in the series, they had tried to make a tunnel, which is like a permanent portal that will allow more powerful demons through so that they can come in and destroy the entire world because, you know, they're, they're just demons. They like chaos and destruction and all that shit. Again, pretty straightforward. But then, once we get to Book 7, that's when we really enter the end game, because before this they found some weird mysterious demon, which they just called the Shadow, because, you know, that's what it is. It's a giant mass of moving shadows, and they don't know exactly what it is. And so, uh, the book Death Shadow is the seventh one, which is the first one on this list. You know, it's, it's hard to explain <laughs> without sounding crazy, but, you know, Death Shadow uh, follows a character named Beck, who has this weird ability to not only remember absolutely everything she's ever heard or seen, but to touch people and start to absorb their memories. And over the course of this one, demons attack and the main group winds up splitting into two, which is why we follow some different characters in the next two books. And the group that Beck is with goes to this cruise ship, which has been taken over by demons and everyone there is dead. And while they're there, they meet the Shadow, and they're trapped for a little bit, and Beck manages to touch the Shadow so she gets some of its memories, and it turns out the Shadow is Death. Like, for a long time, Death was just a force, like time or gravity. You know, it just existed, it didn't have a mind. But then Beck herself, earlier in the series, wound up not dying when she was supposed to, and so that just turned it on. Like, now it has a mind, and it wants to just destroy everything, and so it's working with the demons. and. Well, shit, that's not good. And then uh, the leader of all the human magicians, a guy named Baranibus, who was also the most powerful human magician in many, many hundreds of years, 
uh, he also has to sacrifice himself in order to let the others escape. So they escape, but they're like, well, shit, how do you fight death itself, and also we don't have a leader? Okay, now what? And then we get into book eight, which is Wolf Island, and that one follows the like main main character, Grubbs, uh, as he's going to, well, an island full of werewolves, as the name subtly implies. And basically they're going there to fight some humans who are evil and working with the demons for whatever reason. You know, it's, it's not that important. What's important is that Grubbs is a werewolf, but he's managed to keep it suppressed uh, for, throughout the series. But during this one, when he's surrounded by all of them, it starts to start bubbling back up to the surface. And while they're running around getting uh, attacked by wolves and they finally get cornered and they're about to die, Grubbs finally has to let go and he turns himself into a werewolf. But he kills the alpha of the other pack, and then he says, basically, what? Come at me, bro. Come at me, bitches. Come and fight me. And a bunch of other wolves come and fight him, and he kills them one by one until all the remaining wolves acknowledge him as, you know what, yep, you're you're the leader. Let's, we'll do what you say. And Grubbs <clears throat> also manages to keep, uh, mostly keep control of himself. Like, his human mind is still there, for the most part. And... If I ever do like a top 10 epic moments video, I think that one's going to be on there somewhere because holy shit, that was cool. And then now that Grubbs is the leader of the werewolves, he can take them off and they can go and help fight demons and stuff because demons are starting to come through in portals all over the world and they aren't just attacking little bits at a time now, they're attacking all over the place and now all sorts of humans know about them. Then we get into book nine, which follows another character named Colonel, who just got separated from the others. And this one is probably the most important, because in this one we learn that n not only are there infinite numbers of dimensions, we already knew that, but in <clears throat> our human dimension, it's already an infinite universe. Like, we have Earth, which has intelligent life on it, but then there's also thousands, if not millions, of other planets spread throughout, which also have intelligent life, and also occasionally get attacked by demons and stuff. So... Colonel learns that, like, oh, okay, we're not the only ones that, that are out there that we need to be worrying about. And so he is offered a role to be, one, immortal, but also because he's so good at creating portals, he's offered a role to take uh, a couple of every sentient race to this planet, which they call the Ark, and then when demons come to attack, he'll just open a giant portal and move the Ark through so that they'll be safe from the demons, and they're just going to do that forever and they think that's the only way they're going to preserve life, because otherwise the demons are just going to keep coming forever and eventually destroy everything. And Colonel thinks that's a good uh, idea, but he doesn't want to abandon his friends. So he goes back with the others, and there's another big battle where a whole bunch of other people die, and things just seem more and more hopeless, and eventually Colonel just says, well, you know what? Sorry, this sucks, but I gotta leave. But Grub says, nope, and then gouges out his eyes so that he, he can keep him on Earth. And then we go into the final book, which is, again, everybody's dead. Uh, Beck actually winds up betraying them at the end of the last one. At least it seems like she's betraying them, because later it turns out, oh, okay, she's just working with a demon named Lord Loss in order to kill all the other demons. But in this one, I've never read a book that feels more hopeless. Like, I've read stuff where the bad guys come close to destroying the world and all, but I've never read one where it feels more like... Yep, the, the world just hates you. Life sucks. You are going to lose eventually. Fighting is hopeless. Why don't you just give up? And the characters just cannot bring themselves to give up because, well, if you give up, then you, you might as well already be dead. And so that, that's the main thing that keeps Grubbs going is even though he's lost most of his friends, his uncle, his mentors, all that, he just cannot let go. He, he's fueled by rage and spite and... That's why I wound up really liking him as a main character. And anyways, this is kind of... Well, I don't want to say it's standard as far as climaxes go, where, you know, they're fighting bad guys and trying to come up with a plan in order to defeat them for real. But in some ways, yeah, it is a little bit standard. And they keep losing people along the way, so you really do feel like, yep, the fight is... It's just about over. Like, there's no more that they can do. They're, they're all going to die. Humanity's going to die. The universe is going to be cleansed of life, the demons are going to be the only thing left. But then, uh, at the very end, Beck comes out, and she's like, hey, I actually didn't betray you, let's put all our powers together, and then they destroy the entire universe, 
which was exactly what the demons were hoping to do, sort of, it's kind of hard to explain. But they destroy the entire universe and then recreate it exactly as it was before. Except they kill off all the demonata, save Lord Lost, because they made a deal with him, which I still don't know why they didn't wind up killing him anyways, but they didn't. And then they bring back all the humans and all the everybody else that had died and... I mean, what can you even say to that shit? Like, the Hero of Ages had kind of a similar ending, but this one, Hell's Heroes, is just... Bro. <laughs> like, what do I even say to that? I've never read anything that made me just stop and go, oh, I did not think of that more than Hell's Heroes did. And so, for that reason, The Demonata is my favorite book series. Like, you know, all, all the books together are great, but then those last four, which I still consider them to basically just be one split into a couple of parts, okay? I know I'm gonna get hate for that, but that's how I consider it to be. That is just how you end something. That is how you continue to raise the stakes until the absolute last moment, and then have uh, the characters use their powers in a way that we never really considered to do something crazy, which defeats the bad guys. Like, that. that is how you do it, okay? And that's also why I still kind of have a soft spot for young adult stuff, because there's a lot of stuff that is considered young adult, or could be considered young adult, that I just absolutely love. And the Demonata is, yeah, it could be considered young adult fantasy, even though it goes off in a bunch of crazy different directions. Like, I think more authors need to take notes from Darren Chan. If they want their stories to like stand out from the crowd and be different and not just be standard stuff, read more Darren Chan, and you know what, that's that's it. That is my top 10 favorite books list. I think, I, I mean, it goes without saying that all of them have, you know, great characters and great plot, and they're all very well written and all that. I, that kind of goes without saying, which is why I didn't focus on it too much. This one, I just wanted to sort of give a little bit of a summary and an explanation as to what exactly made them all hit me in that very specific way. Because that's the thing about this, like, obviously it's all opinion-based, but once you get down to, like, the absolute best uh, of anything that someone loves, like your favorite video game or your favorite anything, it's usually going to hit something very specific that only appeals to a small number of people, and other people are going to be a little bit confused about it. There will probably be people that are confused about why I love the Demonata so much. Like, they'll understand that I love it, but they'll just be confused about, well, you don't love this other stuff more? But... It just hits very specific buttons for me, and I'm sure <laughs> a lot of you are the same way. So if you agree, disagree, whatever, comment below, and obviously watch more. That's about all I have to say. Bye. Super big thanks to everyone who watched, including my patrons, Apo Savalainen, Alex Humva, Ashley Watson, Ava Toomer, B. Quinn, Brother Santodis, Christopher Quinten, Emily Miller, Joel, Johnny St. Clair, Madison Lewis Bennett, Ronnie, Sarkis Avakian, Taylor Briggs, Tobacco Crow, Tom Beanie, Topher Wheeler, Vacuous Silas, Vevictus, and all the other names on here. You guys are... you guys are pretty great, and I appreciate all of you watching this far. If you haven't subscribed to my channel already, please do that, and please like the video so it gets shared around more, and, you know, comment on it if you have anything to say. Or if you don't have anything to say, feel free to comment as well. That's, that's also great. Anyways, I'll see you later. Bye.